رزق الثقلين أين جناك This is Wembley in North London, a place where I grew up, a place where I went to school, where I went to work, a place where I searched in life for the pleasures of the world, a place also, surprisingly, where I rejected that and instead turned to God and found Islam, the religion. I have taken me to the point that I uh, you know, there, I, I had no questions left, uh, no realistic questions left uh, to ask. Everything I wanted to know had been answered and explained and, you know, there was just no good reason for me not doing by it. I had an enormous amount of devotion um, to young people. Um, and that's why sort of all the people that are in their 30s today in, in the Bradford area, um, if you ask any of them, whoever they are, who was it that really inspired them when they were little, um, and who was it that showed them the sort of time and love and dedication um, that really um, helped them to generate a strong attachment to the Jamaat, um, they'll mention Selby Sol. As he was growing up, particularly in his early 20s, um, I think it, it wasn't a good outlook in my opinion. Um, we were never a close family, but I was worried about him, and I feel that becoming a Muslim has effectively saved him uh, and made him into a much better person. This is where I grew up. Many things used to happen around here. I had many friends. We used to play in the streets, go into the park. As I grew up in this town, it was a very nice, of course it was famous because of the Wembley Stadium, but generally the houses, the people were very, very nice. I had many, many friends of all different types of um, nationalities, uh, my best friends were West Indian, uh, Indian and so on and so forth. Religion, of course, as you grow up youngsters, you're not really interested in what religion a person is. So this is my upbringing. We was very active doing many, many different things. But again, as I keep stressing, not about religion, but other worldly things. That's what we used to enjoy. We were in a working class family. Uh, it wasn't very religious. Uh, we had um, two or three different faiths being uh, followed by the members of our family. Uh, in particular, in later years, our stepfather was a Roman Catholic. But apart from that, the majority of us were CLE. So this is where it all began over 50 years ago. My family moved to this house back in uh, early 60s. I think it was the house of my mother's father that we moved into. And this is where I grew up and uh, my early days. I lived here for 20 years. Here I lived with my family. We, my mother remarried, so uh, we had the stepfather also living here. And the house has changed a little bit. It's been whitewashed and a lot of the building, the walls and stuff has changed. I went to the local school, which is around the back here for the primary and also the secondary school. After that, I then uh, started working as a paint sprayer and I got apprenticeship there. As you know, our dad was in the National Front, which was, um, a, which was a precursor to UKIP. So he was very much of the opinion that uh, immigrants should go home. Uh, and I think uh, our mum, and even our stepfather and uncles, I think they all were racist, to be honest with you, is my opinion. Um, I think it was the culture they were brought up in, which therefore meant we were brought up in that culture. My family never really came to the church. We never came to worship God in the church. I would come for different activities. Remembrance Day, I would come as a choir boy or I'd come as a scout. Both sides I would come but there was no other real activities to worship God. So this unfortunately was a state of our family that we didn't really discuss God. 
We wasn't really interested in religion and we just pushed it to one side. So here and I only went to the church that I'm aware of, I can remember, for Sunday school on a few occasions. We weren't a religious family um, in any sense of the word, so we didn't go to church. The only time we would go to church would be for weddings and funerals, the, the normal thing, and there wasn't many of them. So we would only go to church if, it, if there was an occasion at the church. We wouldn't go ourselves. So this is one of my favourite places I used to come to, a park which is very close to my house. Now, as we've been mentioning, that my early life had nothing to do with religion. So what changed? What brought me to Islam? What brought me to that point where when one of my friends, who I hadn't met for many years, came to me in the street and tried to talk about Christianity, made me run away to the time when I was seeking God. How did it all change? One of the members in our group was a Muslim. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I wanted to speak to that person, just common chat. And so I was talking about arranged marriages. What's all that about? And why doesn't Muslims meet with other people? Uh, integrate with other people. That person gave me a book. It was entitled The Philosophy and Teachings of Islam. Now at that time in my life, the last thing I wanted was a book on religion. But what happened was that I started reading that book. Now this is a very deep philosophical book and it took, it was very hard for me to read, but I started reading it and um, as I started reading, it started talking about the three stages of man. And at the lowest stage, he was an animal. He just ate because he was hungry. He slept because he was tired. There was no real motive behind what he did. He just followed his natural instincts. And I felt that was me. So that struck me because it said that this was a man like an animal. And no one wants to be called an animal. So. That made me want to read a bit more. I remember one time going to that person and saying that, uh, how do you pray? I don't know what I was thinking, um, but I just thought they, they would give me some words of prayers. Instead, that person gave me the book, the Muslim prayer book. I didn't want people to know, didn't want my family to know, so I used to actually go into the toilet and pray there until I found out, of course, you're not meant to pray in the toilet. Once I found that out, I put a notice outside my door saying, please do not enter. I don't think Tahir was very open during his transition. Um, he was a private person, Tahir. And I don't recall any conversations when I came home from university or afterwards when I lived away from home. It was never brought up by my parents uh, that they were even aware of the conversion taking place. Another problem that I faced was that how do you submit to God? How do you put some being who you can't see before everything, before your loved ones, before your material things? Now that could be fatal words because soon after that, my uh, auntie died, my grandmother died, my father died, my real father died. And it seemed to me that every time this happened, I was thinking that God is saying, you put this before me, I've taken that person away. Now what are you going to do? So fortunately for me, I turned to God. Every time uh, I turned to God, I found comfort in God. The final hurdle was my girlfriend, who uh, I loved very much. and. Uh, how do I give up my girlfriend? Because as I was developing, as I was getting closer to closer to God, I was also getting conscious that this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be having a girlfriend because God is telling me not to. And so there was a conflict. I think I was changing and I think that's what caused us to break up. But eventually uh, she left me and that was the final hurdle. Now. I was in a position where God was before everything and everyone else. When Tahir announced that he had converted to Islam, my mother um, refused to accept it um, 
as did, I think, most of the family. Certainly the elders of the family did not accept it. Um, I think that they thought Tahir was going through a phase and that he would grow out of it. So I think it was rejection of what Tahir had announced and disbelief that it was true. So it was a great shock, I think, to my whole family when Tahir declared he was a Muslim and some of them never accepted it. Welcome, as Oh, lovely to see you again. Yeah, pleasure to meet you, sir. Please come in. Oh, thank you. When we met, do you remember much about that first meeting at the London Mosque? Well, I remember being surprised, actually. I don't think we were actually introduced to each other, but I remember seeing you in the distance and seeing, like, another English person there. And I, I wasn't sure if you were a visitor or, um, or even a member of the press or anybody <laughs> like that. So... I didn't meet you, but I was curious. And um, I didn't meet you there, but I met you at Nadim Malik's house after that. So once I became aware that there was different groups, because I was studying for a long time before I came to the mosque, and then I felt, if I'm going to choose any particular person, I'm going to choose Hazrat Mezzah Glam Ahmed, because I like what he says. So for a long time, I was regarding myself by that time, after reading a lot of literature, as an Amdi Muslim. It was only when you told me that you had done the bat that I knew about the bat. And as you said, uh, Nadim never mentioned anything yeah. about doing a bat form and no one else had come. And I was, asked, I was asked to sign it, but I think I needed a bit of time to consider the implications because, I mean, what was I signing? But when we then went to uh, Sheikh Mubarak um, during that meeting, because obviously Sheikh Mubarak was a long time in Africa. And in Africa, the Christian missionaries would, when you converted, give you a Christian name. So it became his practice to give you a Muslim name. So he gave me the name Tahir. And uh, I came out of that meeting, I said to Nadim, I said, what's happened? <laughs> what is this name? But the more I thought about it, I thought it's good to have a Muslim name. So I kept my surname, uh, out of respect to my family. Uh, I removed one name, which I hated and never used anyway, and changed my name to Tahir. Um, and that's how my name changed. Well they all refused to do it. As far as I'm aware, nobody in my family would call Tahir Tahir. Um, in fact, they made quite a fuss about it and refused to do it. It might have been in later years that they changed their minds, but as far as I'm aware, nobody in the family um, accepted what Tahir had said. I couldn't have conversations with them and refer to him as Tahir. I had to refer to him as his birth name. Otherwise, the family would not talk to me. So it was a case that, yes, it was very difficult. Um, over the years, it's become a lot, lot easier. When I attended the Pakistani Jalsa in 1983, one of the things that happened there was that I met some of the Jamir students from different countries, African countries and so on and so forth. Now, I'd heard a little bit about Jamir, just a little bit, maybe at a Shura or something like that, but I knew nothing really about Jamir. When I started speaking to these Jamir students, the idea came to me that how about me dedicate my life? I, I thought he would have a lot of difficulty in Pakistan. I, th um, I, I just didn't see how Tahir was prepared for it. And so, although I didn't, um, I don't believe I, I disencouraged him, I certainly um, was worried about what he would find when he went to Pakistan. Um, I was worried about how he, would, how he would live there, how his life would be there. I had just obviously been in the uh, community for a few months, but I still felt that I had done many bad things in my life. And maybe by dedicating my life, God would be pleased with me and will forgive me. So it was a bit selfish idea on my side. I didn't really study about what Jamir was. It was more of the idea of sacrifice, of trying to please God. And that was really my life then, because now, my life, the only thing that interested me at that point was God and his religion. We like to think of what God thinks rather than what man thinks. 
And in our opinion, this is what God wants, how Islam should be practised. I think it allowed me, on the occasions I did talk about him to people, including my family, that it showed that Tahir was devoted and that it was a, a decision that he had made of his own accord, because you can't um, persuade someone to do something like that, I don't believe. And so I felt it was um, evidence of Tahir's commitment to Islam. And I thought it was a very good idea. This uh, response from my family and friends, I then wrote about a three page letter to the Khalifa, uh, telling him about my uh, experience of Jelsa, how happy I was that I attended the Jelsa, and then that I'd like to dedicate my life and try to bring the British people out of their darkness into God's light. Towards the end of my time in Pakistan, after being there for three years, the idea started to come to me that uh, about marriage. Now, I felt that there wasn't going to be a suitable person in the UK, so more than likely, I would marry a girl from Pakistan or Cardian. So I wrote a few letters to some of my friends, um, asking if there was an English girl who I could marry. Now, I was thinking an English girl only because of my family. It may be better for them if I married an English convert. I don't think the fact that Tahir was marrying a white girl really made much difference to my family. I think there was that prejudice against Islam, which was there. So whilst I was here in 1986, I got some question and answer tapes from Hazur. Um, maybe there was about uh, 10 tapes of Hazur's question and answer sessions. And when I took them back uh, to Pakistan and started listening to them, on one of these tapes, there was a lady and she was asking six questions. And then there was another tape um, where that same lady became uh, an, uh, an Amdi. So the first thing I knew about it was that I got a letter from Hazur. And Hazur said that I've given permission for this lady to write to you to get to know whether you'll be suitable for marriage. So I didn't see anything wrong in that, particularly. I mean, arranged marriages are not that unheard of. Um, even at the time it happened, even though we are talking decades ago, it still was, was known about arranged marriages. And so I suppose because of my background, I would have preferred it if it hadn't have if it had been a love match rather than an arranged match but on the other hand you've just got to look at how many people get divorced to realize that love matches not necessarily work as well as arranged marriages i actually think arranged marriages are better with respect to the partners understanding the requirements of marriage. It was uh, a very blessed marriage. We've now um, had five children and uh, the first three were what we know uh, boys. One of those boys has now gone on to become a missionary himself, uh, which is also very nice that he's followed the path. Although it was his choice, we never pushed him at all, but he's followed the same path as I followed. In 1989, I'd just finished uh, a contract working in Nigeria and I moved back to, to the UK to take up a position in England and moved into a, a rented house in Yorkshire. And this was just before Ramadan, that specific year. And we were looking for a, a Ramadan calendar for, for the Ramadan fast. And uh, we thought for a minute about how we could actually find the mosque where we could get the calendar from. So eventually we decided, well, let's have a look in the yellow pages. And maybe it was divine, I don't know, or maybe it was just the way it happened. But, you know, Ahmadiyya Muslim Association obviously starts with an A. The thing about Selby Saab was that he was an incredibly uh, sincere individual. You know, that he used to talk from the heart. Um, the things that he was saying to my family and to us as children, 
because you can say things to adults and in a way that they can comprehend something, but the way you have to then deliver it to children is completely different. Now the Jamaat became seriously important to us was at that time we had, you know, two young children and we were a little bit of a... And we didn't really know how we were going to educate them in Islam. We really appreciated that, um, the message itself and also uh, the person delivering the message on this occasion. And, uh, and we liked what we heard. So the family accepted, alhamdulillah, Islam. First my mother and then um, not too long after that my father accepted. So my mother and, and me and my brother and then my father later on. And I think it was probably my memory is not exactly a hundred percent, but I think it was probably the Jilsa after that, maybe 92 or 93, that, uh, you know, I did, I did buy it and became, a, you know, a fully fledged Ahmadi and I've never, never looked back since then. There are lots of things, mashallah, that, that contribute towards that. And I think Selby Saab definitely for us as a family, and for each of us in, as individuals, uh, he and his family form an important part of who we are today. Um, and that's a great blessing for us. Tahir had taken me to the point that, uh, you know, that I, I had no questions left, uh, no realistic questions left uh, to ask. Everything I wanted to know had been answered and explained. And, you know, there was just no good reason for me not doing Baya. And I think that that part of Selby Saab's um, life as a, as a missionary is sort of one of those um, selfless uh, aspects of what a missionary does that often go sort of amiss and people don't recognize. But they are really um, the imp most important contributions that missionaries make in terms of the tarbiyat of young people and helping them to um, empowering them so that they can become um, real leaders in society, in their homes, in society in general. I just feel it's really good. It's been really good for him. Um, I think it's made him into a much better person. And he still surprises me sometimes because occasionally I, I find articles about him in the news or I see him on the television. And it always um, pleases me that that's my little brother doing all of this. When I see the sea, it makes me think about my purpose in life, that why I'm here. And we see the vastness of the sea, and people feel that this life is forever, and that's the most important thing. But when you see the waves, they come and they go, and they're very temporary. And that actually is what this life is. We get too much lost in this life. And in fact, this was one of the things, the greatest things I think that Islam taught me. What was my purpose in life? And it's something which I often ask people to think about. Why are we here? Why, what is this life really about? And get them to realize that the most important thing is not the waves, it's that sea, that vastness the end journey, not this temporary life. But we should strive to try to please God and attain His nearness. This is what I've learned and this is what I want to try to help others to find, that we must keep trying to strive to please God and to win His favour and to have that eternal life in paradise. And so become part of the vastness of the sea and not the short-term waves. عطشت قلوب العاشقين لراحك فأجر كؤوسك واسق من سقياك